As business owners, we have a tendency to put a ton of effort into marketing and sales in order to acquire and generate new business. Then when it comes to growing our teams, we scratch our heads and wonder how come it's so difficult to hire great personnel. Well, today's lesson is gonna be a mind shift for you. Danny Kerr from Breakthrough Academy is here to help us better understand why we're falling short when it comes to hiring. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Contractor Success Academy. I'm super excited because we've got a familiar face here in the house with us today. Danny Kerr from Breakthrough Academy. Danny, thanks for being here, buddy. Hey man, thanks for having me, Mark. Good stuff. So Danny, you've uh, been here before. Like I said, we recorded um, how to build a resilient business together. I think that was back in October, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And we also um, interviewed, did a webinar with uh, mutual customers, which uh, was titled Scaling to Eight Figures and Beyond. So for anyone watching, if uh, either of those topics interest you, uh, scour through YouTube and uh, check out those videos, awesome content and everyone really, really delivered there. So Danny, uh, today we're talking about scaling a business and you know, one factor in particular is super, super important when it comes to scaling a uh, business beyond a certain level. We're talking about recruiting. Before we get right into the subject matter, maybe uh, for those of you who haven't heard of you uh, before or Breakthrough Academy, just give us a quick kind of overview of uh, who you are and what exactly BTA does, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in the trades. I ran a painting company. Um, for those who've ever heard of it, it's called College Pro Painters. So it's a, it a student-based franchise organization that taught young people how to run their own painting companies. So when I was 18, I did that. Um, when I was in my 20s, I became a GM for them. And then um, later on in my mid-20s, I became kind of VP for Western Canada for recruitment, actually, for recruitment and development. So I oversaw the recruiting of 150 franchises a year and Usually had 100 resumes a day on my desk, <laughs> so <laughs> wow. I definitely did my share of recruitment, which we'll get a lot into. And um, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about systems. I learned about about scalable processes to onboard and develop people at scale. And a lot of that DNA is uh, what helped me form what's called Breakthrough Academy. So I currently run that with uh, two other partners. I'm one of three owners. I've got about 30 people on the team and um, about 300 and 370 companies now we actively work with and yeah we're just we're basically there to almost give like a a business in a box like a franchise system without people having to buy a franchise but it's all for contractors so painting landscaping renovations roofing sub trades people in that kind of category who are trying to scale up but they don't have all the tools they're kind of making it from scratch themselves we've built it all for them and we help them integrate it properly as well so mm -hmm. awesome well thanks for that danny appreciate it so with respect to recruiting, um, as you've mentioned, you've done your your fair share. You said 150 locations, I think you're responsible for. 150 before. franchises a year, yeah. So some of them were already wow. pre-filled from previous franchisees coming back, but 60% of them we had to fill again every single year. So my job was to help with retention to make sure people came back. And it was also to find new people to operate these areas. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions lined up as, as we get through this. Um, in general, though, to uh, scale the business to a certain size, how much importance or, or how much impact do you think something like recruiting has? I know it's something that's under, um, not necessarily undervalued, but people don't put as much importance to, to, to recruiting as they should, I think. Yeah. Um, on a scale, I don't know, you know, one to 10, maybe <laughs> how important is recruiting to get to, uh, I can say it's probably the most important factor for most businesses in the contracting space right now. That really? wasn't true 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially, I always say this, but you go back to 2008, the recession was happening. People were all about like, how do I learn to do sales and marketing? Because if I can't do sales and marketing, I can't have a business to run, which is obvious. Now we're in this weird twilight zone where even through a pandemic, we have more work than we could ever handle. And right. there is even less people available. So it's becoming every day or every year, at least, increasingly more important to understand recruitment because we're, we're no longer in the recession of getting more work. We're in the recession of people. And we're not really seeing it or feeling it um, because I just don't think it's a topic that's discussed or, or widely understood well enough. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Good stuff. Well, I understand you have a couple of slides that you had prepared for us. So if you don't mind, we can screen share and get into that. Sure. So 
what I thought it would be good for today is to walk everybody through the step-by-step recruiting process that I use for many, 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 many years to help me find good people. Um, it's very methodical. There is a lot to it. And I will say, for those who watch this today, you don't necessarily need to do everything I'm going to talk about. I think it's, it takes about a year or two to fully integrate this properly. But I think that there's weak points to your interview process that seem like good low-hanging fruit thing to make change on. This is a good roadmap on everything to go do. So we'll walk through it. And then, um, Mark, I think what we've got to is I've got actually templates for all this stuff. So we'll give everybody some downloads that they, if they want at the end as well. We'll give them a little link to grab yeah, some of the stuff. Yeah, That would be great. Sound good? Yep, absolutely. Right. So it starts with what you're seeing on screen here, which is building an ideal candidate profile. There's a lot of different things you could go do to find people. There's a lot of different things you could put on your ads. There's a lot of different things you could interview people on to see if they're a good fit for a role. But if you don't have a target to focus on, then good luck finding that person. Um, Mark, you do marketing all the time. Um, maybe I'll get you to explain this a little bit. But what's the importance of your ideal c- customer profile? How do you use that, and where does that come into play? Yeah, th- thanks, Andy. I mean, customer customer personas, customer profiles is the is the the building block of anything that you do when it comes to marketing. If you don't have that, um, you're putting a message out there that you know, you really have no idea if it's going to you know, appeal to that individual that you're that you're looking for, right? So I think that's that's number one. Uh, you've got to identify who it is that you want to get in front of. Uh, what do you need to say that's going to appeal to that individual? So these these persona in marketing, they call it the the persona. You know, discovery persona exercise. Some people use the word avatar. There's all kinds of different uh, you know names for it, but uh, definitely the starting point for sure. Totally. So recruiting is no different. <laughs> So with, within that, we need to know, you know what we're looking for, obviously. So we're, what are their strengths, their weaknesses, their core values, their skill sets that we need to help them fulfill in the job requirements, which I think a lot of people do, actually. I think a lot of people think through that when they, when they drop an ad. But I think they miss on this part, which is what excites them. How do they want to feel about their work? What are their goals? What are they fearful of? Why would, you know, understanding the needs of your ideal candidate are huge. And just like you're talking about in marketing, until you understand that, you don't know who you're going to be attracting properly. Um, so a really good story that illustrates this is one of the first times I ever did this was for another project manager for my painting team. And I had one guy who was awesome. And he I needed probably two more of him. <laughs> yesterday and uh i was just like man like i need to understand you like why do you work for us what brought you here in the first place what keeps you around what excites you about your job what are your goals like and i got into it with him and he, and he started to give me some interesting answers around just like you know i don't really you know i don't really love most jobs but to me this isn't a job he's like this is more of like i'm on a high level sports team he's like danny you're more of my coach than you are my boss He's like, I, you give me goals to go after every single week and then I get to go make touchdowns basically as I hit these goals and I get paid for it, which is awesome. You, know, you give me freedom and autonomy to strategize the crews in my own way on how we get things done. He's like, dude, like I literally, I'm like on a high level sports team in school. I'm the quarterback of the football team. I just get to do that in your business and I get paid for it, which is dope. And I was like, right. So I changed my ads, which used to say, need (laughs) project manager to run painting teams to need quarterback to drive our painting team. Sick of a boss, wish you had more of a coach, looking for freedom, autonomy in your role to score touchdowns in your own way, want to get paid and compensated for performance-based pay. Boy, do we have a job for you. And I spoke to athletes. And I went from getting a bunch of old, tired painters that maybe had 20 years experience telling me they could manage my crews, which to be honest, it wasn't the right personality type I was looking for, to athletes who actually had a little less experience in painting, but a lot more experience in leadership, which is really truly what I was looking for. And just that shift in language where when people who were reading it, the right people who were reading it were drawn into it versus just another random ad. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. I love that story, Danny. It's, I mean, it's, it's marketing at the end of the day. And I think too often we think that, you know, this is falls under HR. So let's just hand it off and get somebody to, put this job description together and, oh, these are all the boxes that, you know, the candidate needs to kind of tick off, but it's much more than that. Um, and yeah, I, that would have been my guess. You would have told me that kind of job description. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to resonate with people and you're going to get much better uh, caliber candidates reaching out to you that are just like you said, they're, they're compelled to reach out and talk to this company because it spoke to them. So that's really interesting. Totally. So that actually illustrates exactly what my next slide is, which is how this is very similar to a marketing and sales process, right? 
So if you have a marketing and sales process in your company, it probably goes something like this. Ideal candidate profiled, advertisement put out, lead generated, setup call done, estimate you know generated, job awarded, you know new customer onboarded, right? Recruiting is no different. It's an ideal candidate profile built. Job posting built off of that. Applications start to come in. A conversion call is done prior to an interview being set up. The interview is then done. There's a selection process and then an onboarding of a new employee. They, they mirror each other. And for those of you who are good at sales and marketing, you are also good at recruiting. You maybe just hadn't realized the similarities between the two. Hmm. Well, the biggest things I find for most people is it's not so much, you know, hey, like we're not good at finding good people. It's we're not putting enough time, money and energy behind this before we can even give it a real good chance to find out if we're good or bad at this, right? If I sit down with people and I look at their books, which I do a financial audit on pretty much every member that comes into BTA, we start to look at things and go, like, isn't that interesting? You're, you're spending $20,000 on Google AdWords to find more work and $500 a year on recruiting ads. And yet you're telling me you can get as much work as you want. You just can't produce it all. And if only you could find people, you could actually grow the company to the next level. <laughs> And they're like, right, I never really thought about it that way. And I'm like, I know, because in your DNA, you were, you were tuned a certain way to think about what success meant and what to focus on to get success. But the marketplace changed around all of us over the last 10 years, and a lot, all of us have adapted accordingly. Yeah, and I mean, laid out like this, when you see that it, it literally are more or less the exact same steps and how you start with that you know, discovery and you put time into crafting the right message and then you follow through... Um, yeah, there are, there are tons of, you know, marketing dollars and resources and time that go into customer acquisition. Why not do the same for, for team members, for employees? And at the end of the day, we're all service based businesses, right? So we're only as good as our people. So that's, uh, that's interesting. I think maybe Danny, people see it as, you know, uh, sales is something that, you know, you, you deliver work, you generate revenue, but bringing on employees, I mean, it, it's a cost, it's a cost, it's a cost. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so I think that's something that people, uh, you know, they want to kind of skimp out or just get by with the bare minimum and, hey, let's post an ad here and there and, you know, talk to a couple of people, anyone know anyone and, uh, you know, you don't get uh, predictable results that way. It's interesting too, people. Yeah, I do see that. I hear that a lot too. They're like, ah, oh, should I hire this project manager? Like they're going to pay them 60 grand a year and like, I only make 120. Like I'm going to make half of what I made last year. And I'm like, no, this person is built, is there to help you grow revenue to create an ROI and you need to be able to set up the business to do so accordingly, right? Like my job was to hire 150 franchises a year because we knew that each franchise was worth about $20,000 in Roy Rev royalty revenue at the end of the year. And so the more recruiting you were able to do, the more money you were able to make as a company, there was a direct relational result to that. And if right. you don't have that understanding in your business or you're not sure of how that works, that is one of the most important things you can do to understand ROI per role. <clears throat> building each role with a specific deliverable, like a, a job description goal that they have to hit to be able to worth, be worth their weight. And so whether it's even just a painter, you know, if you look at a painter, a painter can usually paint, let's say 500 bucks a day, a single painter. And if you're making a gross profit margin of say 30 to 40% on that every single day, that's hundreds and hundreds of gross profit dollars that either get made or don't get made based on your ability to get that person in the season and time. Right. So if you're hitting May, June, July, and you're in your busy season, you're short two painters, you're like, I'll get one eventually. Every day that goes by is hundreds of dollars lost in gross profit versus mm -hmm. the money that you would have, you know, you're like, well, what, how much do I pay this person? It's like, that's negligible in the grand scheme of where you're at or where you're going. Yeah, that's right. What's, what's the cost of inaction? What's the opportunity cost of not having the right person in the right seat? Totally. Yeah. So. It's good. So that is first step. Next is obviously building the job ads, which we talked a little bit about. But essentially, we want to have a job posting that sells to these ideal candidates, right? So we usually have a bit of a formula to this where we create a title that's in catching, engaging. We have a short company profile, but in light of what our ideal candidate is looking for. So we could talk about all the things that we're proud about our business, or we could just talk about the things that our ideal candidate is looking for. Right? We can describe the job just duties, but instead of talking all about what we love, we talk about what our ideal candidate would love. Right? So a good example nice. of this is for a sales role. Mark, like what are, what are good salespeople naturally suck at? Yeah, paperwork, the, the admin sure. stuff, the totally that kind of stuff. <laughs> They're not built for it. So like even I remember in my sales ads, I would put like work with company administrator to take care of your sales admin needs. 
It was, a, it was a part of the description of duties. Now, did it have to do much with their job? Kind of, but it would draw in the right candidate to be like, finally, you get it, right? I want to work with these guys. I'll be able to sell twice as much as a result of not having to do all this bog, bog down administrative work. Yeah. So I'm building my job ad to subtly sell to my ideal candidate based on what their interests are. Then I have a qualify out. So here's things that we're, you know, needing from you. You need to be able to pass a drug screening test, have a license, whatever it is. Just make sure that they understand what you know, the qualifiers are. Um, and the deal breaker is essentially kind of similar idea. And then there's compensation. So I don't always put compensation in, but I will when it's a role that's very well defined that essentially is the same, you know, hey, you have this much experience, you come in at this wage. If I have a role where it's you know project manager or somebody that could swing quite a bit based on their experience, I actually don't put compensation in because it can shoot myself in the foot. I could be like, yeah, mm. I'll pay seventy grand for this role, and this hundred thousand dollar a year person doesn't apply for me. Then I would have paid a hundred grand because they're twice as capable as the seventy grand guy I thought I was going to get. So that kind of makes right. sense. So I leave some of that compensation stuff open for interpretation for more advanced roles. For basic roles though, where it's a little bit more transactional, I'll often I'll often put it in. So. Awesome. Yeah, I think these are these are golden nuggets here. So the notion of uh, again making sure that you're you're speaking to your ideal customer persona. What are they great at? Whether they what are they not so interested in? And communicate that um, is nothing like reading a boring job description, right? If you read something that really speaks to everything that you believe in and kind of stand for, uh, it's just much more much more compelling. And um, you know, same thing with same thing with even candidates, Danny. I think we can kind of flip that around. Um, and you've hired tons of people, right, in in your day. So I mean, it's it's well, how do you feel when you get a resume where it's all about me, this and I that, and this is what I've done, and nobody, you know, takes the time to express, you know, hey, I've done the research on Breakthrough Academy, and I love what you stand for and what you guys do, and you know, and it's all about them. It you, you don't create as much of a connection, right? So I think in hiring, that's that's equally important. Um, and then that last point on salary there too, I find that really interesting because. Um, you can save yourself a lot of time, I think, if you do, right? If you do put that job description out there, and like you say, for those roles that are super well outlined and kind of easy to sort of compare with other roles, you put a, a salary on there, you can sort of weed out people that, you know, wouldn't be a fit and looking for too much money or whatever, right? Um, but then the senior roles, you got to give yourself that range because you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot. So that's uh, that's really interesting. That's true. So. This is actually, I thought I'd show it up, show you guys. This is our recruiting page. Can you see it on here? So it's got our team up here. We've actually spent some time and money building a video. So beyond just trying to, through words, describe the experience of working for us, we've created a pretty epic like video that walks through our experiences and our out trips and interviews all of our staff and goes through why they work with us. And it really builds the energy of what it's like to work here at Breakthrough Academy. And so I, th I just encourage everybody, really look at this as a sales, marketing and sales effort. This is not just hypothetical. This is literally we are draw drawing up landing pages and videos and putting quite a bit of assets and money into drawing in the right types of people. Lower low video, we've got our available positions. And each position is custom written to attract the ideal candidate. So there's quite a bit of hours that go into drawing up this ad, thinking through what questions we want to post at the top here to really capture the attention of our ideal person. And this is awesome. So anyone who's interested, if they come back, do the research and check out, you know, the company, this has everything that they could possibly want, you know, to, to learn about the business. So are you putting your all your job descriptions on this page as well? Yeah. So we have like our main page here oh, that opening. holds, yeah, basically it's like join the team page with our major video and then all of our positions available down below and then the application mm -hmm. form if they want to apply for any of them. But yeah, if people want to check it out, just go to our website, btacademy.com backslash join dash the dash team, or you can just find it if you go to the very bottom um, menu. We don't have it as a big public part of our top section because people don't naturally go to our website to look for jobs. The right. reason it's here is actually what I'm going to go through next, which is how do you get these job ads out, right? Mm. So what you're doing is you're essentially starting to distribute this through all types of different mediums. So this link is on my, you know, Indeed ad, my ZipRecruiter ad, my, you know, whatever, monster.ca ad if you use that. What we do use it mostly for is actually through Facebook. So we get all of our staff to direct message one to 200 people each on Facebook Messenger saying, hey, so-and-so, our company XYZ is looking for a person in XYZ role. Curious if you know anybody who'd be a good fit. See link below. You know, P.S. We're offering a $500 or $2,000 hiring bonus. Be happy to share that with you if you did know anybody. Kind of thing. 
So what, what's, what that's, what's happening in that is that we have 30 staff right now. They're not messaging people to see if they want a job. They're saying, do you know anybody who has, you know, would be interested in something like this? Hmm. Now we've got, say, 100 messages going out per staff member. That's 3,000 direct Facebook messages that go out in the course of a few hours. Wow. That's really that's, powerful. Uh, that's interesting, yeah. And from a cost standpoint, other than the time, not really, uh, not really any fees associated to that. Totally. And we're directing organic traffic to our, our landing page, essentially, our website page, of which, again, no one's going to go search for this intentionally. But if we put it out there to the public in the right way, people click on that link and it leads them to something that's premeditated. That in itself is a full-time job, right? You got your job description that you craft and you head over to Indeed, you publish it there and then, oh, you want to publish it to LinkedIn or to, you know, Facebook, you know, marketplace or what have you. Uh, that's very time consuming. That's just, we're talking one role now. So multiply this by all your open positions and then managing it, right? You've got candidates that are coming in, you've got to feel them. Um, we've uh, tested recently a uh, software application tracking software to help accelerate the rate at which we can kind of get through. That's something people may want to uh, look at if they're, if they have any, you know, amount of, of, of volume or, and, and I, I guess it's usually what HR folks are, are using internally, but um, ourselves here, you know, I'm pretty involved in a lot of the hiring and I like to see, you know, how all this stuff works. Uh, but it doesn't take too long before you find yourself spending a ton of time on HR. So, uh, you know, things like this, this little hack here of <laughs> leveraging your, uh, your, your team and your staff to put out direct messages. I could see that turning out a really nice, um, a really nice response. Totally. You want another hack? Yep. All right. Let's do it. Let's I'm all about surround. the hacks, Benny. Keep uh -huh. going. <laughs> this is around keeping track of applicants and the long-term benefits that you gain from it. So oh, I know. what happens is you have people applying to you. And when I used to have 100 resumes a day coming in, it was very easy for me to forget who the hell I was reading all the time. I'd read a resume and I'd be like, who was that again? Read a resume again, who was that again? I finally stopped printing them out, stopped killing trees, and I started <laughs> saving the file. Um, you could either do this in your Gmail. I actually did this in Dropbox. So I would, right. um, in my Dropbox, have three different files, apps converted, app re apps rejected, and apps to call. So anyone new that came in, I'd, I'd read through the resume. I'd relabel the Word file that they sent me or the PDF file, and I would name it at a score out of 10. So it was like an 8 out of 10, dash their name, dash the position they were applying for, dash any interaction I had with them. So like left message, sent email. Now they're all in this apps to call section. And I've got them all labeled out of 10. So I can sort by file name and have the 9s and 10s all go to the top and the 7s, 8s, and 6s all go down to the bottom. And now I've got a really good sortable application file to pull from. Now I can call through them all. And as I call through them, put left message once, left message times two, times three, you know, whatever, and times maybe four. And then I put them to apps rejected if I don't hear back from them. Um, or if they, I do talk to them and they got a job, you know, got job put them in apps rejected. The ones I do talk to and convert to interview, I put them in apps converted <clears throat> and away I go. Now it'll, that helps A, just for like keeping on top of people. I always found like my top nines and tens would usually get jobs within a week. So if I wasn't on them and I was got muddled down by my sixes and sevens that kept applying to me, I couldn't get a hold of my nines because I didn't even have them labeled properly. I would lose them. The other big thing is these applicants can be reused, rehashed later on. So now I've got this huge save file of apps rejected that are all labeled out of 10 and I can message all of them every time I have a new position saying, hey, so-and-so, our company XYZ is looking for a person in XYZ role. Curious if we know anybody who'd be a good fit. See link below. And now I'm reusing my own database of interested applicants and their network to keep helping me find good people. And I know that either A, they might be interested, maybe they weren't at the time or something didn't work out, or B, now I can tap into their network. Now, I don't usually message people below an eight because I don't want to re-attract people that I wasn't maybe that interested in, but my eights, nines, and tens, I would always re-message when we had new positions. And now I'm just increasing my pool of influence. Nice. So again, think of lead flow, right? You get your leads, you try and go for the sale, the sale doesn't happen, do you just throw your leads away or do you nurture them? And this is kind yeah, of a part of that. A, you recycle. And then here, what we see on the screen looks like your that's a Gmail inbox. You're using labels, or that's your uh, that's how you're creating your uh, your your folders, I guess. Yeah, and that's sometimes the easiest ways you just sort them into there. I started using Dropbox just so the rest of my team could access it all, and it was a little easier okay. for me. But yeah. either or, just essentially what you're doing is you're you're not printing out these things. You're 
you're sorting them and then you're basically also rating them and then you have a place to yeah, yeah. grab them when you need yeah, them. Really neat. So, cool. What do we have next here? So when you've started to generate some applications, you then have people to call. So you have to have a very intentional, what's called conversion call, where you're pre-selling your candidate properly and you're making sure you're not bringing the wrong people to the interview itself. So this is usually a 20-minute call that you spend focused where you're sitting down and you're understanding you know, a bit about them, their past experience, what they're looking for now, what their needs are, what interests them about the ad they just saw. And then you're giving them a helicopter tour of the company itself. And so when you do start to do that, you're starting to kind of softly sell to them based on their needs and what they're looking for, what your company's all about. So the helicopter tour is a tour of the position or the company, but in light of that candidate's needs. Does that kind of make sense? Right. And from there, I'm like, yeah, this is a good, pretty good person, actually. And they seem pretty interested and in, they're really wanting to look into this. I'll start to explore past work experience, their deal breakers, make sure they have the basic necessities to be able to do this job. And then I'll make a decision if we're going to do an interview setup or not. So this will do two things. One, it'll stop me from having those interviews that within 30 seconds of the person walking in, I already know it's not going to be a fit <laughs> and right. waste an hour of my time and their time. That's and right. it'll make sure more people show up. When I started doing this properly, I went from a 50% interviewee show up rate to an 80% interviewee show up rate. And all that changed was I was silently kind of softly selling them into wanting to show up to this thing because I was going through what we do versus what their needs are. And I was giving them a very good setup and expectations um, format at the end of my call. I would have them write down everything that you know we're going to go through. I'd make some, they write down my my uh, phone number, the address of where we're going to be meeting. I'd actually ask them, give them some homework to do. I'd give them our website, tell them to go find 10 questions off of that that they'd like to know more about that they can bring up at the interview i would prepare them properly and i would basically make them feel very accountable for showing up yeah i love that idea i think when you can put sort of the ball in their court give them a little bit of homework you can it helps you to gauge also a level of interest on their side right if they come back and they're prepared and they're organized and got their questions and they're really interested already you know that's going to help you in your your decision making ability whereby if it's the opposite they show up you know they're late they don't have their stuff organized. They're just not on their game. You're right away. You can disqualify them and not waste, like you said, a ton of your time. Exactly. Yeah. So this is usually what I do is I print a ton of these conversion call sheets out. So we're going to give them away for, for download for everybody, but I print them out. It goes through set, set questions. I go through the questions. I fill out the answers. I staple this to the resume and then I bring as a little package with me to the interview itself. Right. So the only trees you're killing are for people you're actually talking to. <laughs> still killing a couple of trees. Yeah. Yeah. Still killing a couple. You can use your iPad if you're fancy. I still like pen and yeah, paper yeah, when yeah, I'm talking yeah. to people. But yeah. All right. So that is that. And then from there, we get into behavioral interviewing. So now we're finally at a stage where we're sitting down with good people. Now, this is where a lot of people fight me, but I would spend minimum one to two hours with each candidate, even if it's just for a basic painter role. And a lot of people are like, that's crazy. Like, why would you do that? And I'm like, you know what's more crazy? Spending 40 hours a week with somebody on your job sites for potentially years and only interviewing them for half an hour. That's I actually right. think two hours isn't enough. I just think right. that there's also a certain level of time that a painter is going to sit down with you before they start to go MIA. But, yeah. you know, for our internal team where we hire coaches and some pretty more advanced roles, we'll spend six months to a year interviewing that person. It's pretty intense. But the reason we do it is we want to build a relationship with that person early on. We want to make sure they're a really good fit for the company. And we want to make sure there's longevity, right? Because if you put a bad hire into your company, the cost of having that person exist is way more costly than just having no person at all. So we spent quite a bit of time on this. Internally in our company, of the 30 staff we have, we've only ever let one person go in the history of our business which is very interesting. Wow. And so it's allowed us to be very efficient once we get people operating. Now, if you ask any of them about the time it took to get involved, yeah, it was a lot. It was a ton of work, but it pays dividends long-term. It's kind of short-term pain for long-term gain, that typical kind of statement. Absolutely, yeah. And we've seen that firsthand. We get to talk to a bunch of the, the coaches and, and some of the uh, the team members at, at, at BTA. And I think even you guys you know, have that as part of your DNA and it, it carries over to when you're bringing partners into your programs. I know we had conversations at length on many occasions, um, you know, before uh, getting to the point where it, uh, we were able to kind of solidify partnership and, um, and kind of get that going. And yeah, it, it, like you said, it just speaks volume to the fact that you're not just, you know, bringing on anybody and anybody and making referrals to someone you just met <laughs> over lunch for 30 minutes, you know, you can't scale that way. 
you could try, no. but you're always going to go two steps forward and then one step back again, two steps forward and then one step back in, and you'll still move forward. It's just choppy and, and yeah, messy yeah. And, it, and the right people leave the company because they're sick of the choppiness. You'll, always, you'll be scaling with B-list candidates versus scaling with A-listers. From there, you get into the interview. And there's a lot to be said about doing a really good interview, but just the one note I'll make on today's meeting is just the importance of looking at preferences and abilities over looking just at skill sets and experience. So skill and experience is great, but for most positions, especially in the contracting space, you can train people how to be better in those positions and in their skill set. They can grow that over time. You can't train someone to have the preference to set and hit goals or the preference to overcome challenges through pure hard work or the preference to, to manage stress in pursuit of a goal or the preference to have introspection and be objective. These are all like personality traits that are either inside somebody based on their past experiences or they're not. And so what you want to be looking for over just how many years have you been painting? How many years have you been managing? How many years have you been selling? It's, you know, what's some goals you've had in your life? Why were they important to you? How long did they last? What steps did you take along the way? What was the end result? What did you learn from that experience? And learning about people's past experiences helps you predict and see patterns and how they will be in their future. I've interviewed over a thousand people. <laughs> it's a God awful large amount of people. And I've seen things and I've seen patterns where I remember one year I was very intentional about like, I am going to, even if they don't have all these preferences and abilities, I'm going to get them to be good at setting and hitting goals. I know I can do it. I'm a goal setter. Like I'll teach them how to do it. 90% of them did not. A couple did. Right. 10% did. But it came not from me wanting them to go do it or training them. It came from their own self-will to make change in their lives. And you can't hire people with the roads colored glasses on just going by what they say they would do or could do if given a chance. You have to go on past experience to predict that future behavior, no matter how bad you need somebody. Mm -hmm. Have you always, uh, Danny, <clears throat> followed this kind of process uh, when it comes to you know your, your, your interviewing process? Or have you, with time, after having interviewed so many people gotten to the point where you can kind of analyze or quickly assess somebody and get to the point where you feel like you've got a pretty good handle on them, you know, whether or not you've got to continue going through the whole, the whole thing. Um, I, I can cancel it. I am, I'm good at canceling an interview earlier these days, I'd say, mm -hmm. but I'm not good at making a judgment call on, yes, you're a good fit. I can tell quickly. Right. So if I'm like, yeah, this is not going to work out, I just, I'm good at calling it a spade a spade. If I'm like, yeah. I really think this is going to work out, that actually forces me to do more work to prove it. That's right. Okay. I got you. Yeah. And, it, and it's easy to get excited and be like, oh, I love this person. This person's like, they're ticking all the boxes, but like, you got to watch get that. Emotional. Yeah. Right. You got to watch that because that comes back to bite you and, and often does because you miss over certain details or even if you don't miss over certain details, you don't set good expectations with the person early on. The expectation you're setting with them is it's easy to get a job here and they're honored to have me so I can kind of come in and do whatever I want versus they had to work hard to get hired and they were grilled and they're lucky to be here. Yeah. And I, I think if you stick to your, to your process, and you give everyone kind of an equal chance. It's uh, in the end, you're you're going to come out on top. I think some people just naturally interview really well, whereby others don't so much. Just like people don't test well, and so this is kind of a, a way to ensure that you're not, uh, you know, you're not being too emotional about any one decision. Yeah, and you're and you're building a relationship with the person. It's amazing how much yeah. you know. I'll go through this. Now, I don't recommend everybody do this, but I would go through these preferences and abilities. There's about ten of them, and I would pick a you know three to four different ones per role I was interviewing for. But I would actually put my notes down at the end of the interview and say, would you like to know what I found out about you? And I'd actually go through their strengths of what I really like thought was strong about who they were. And I go through some of their weaknesses and areas that they might need to improve on if we work with them. And for mm -hmm. high performers, that attracted them more to me. Being like, if you figured that out with me in an hour or two of an interview, imagine it'd be like to work with you where you can actually develop me over the long term. Right. And the, the bad performers were actually scared of that. They're like, don't tell me like I'm bad at this. Like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, hey, <laughs> bad introspection. So, sorry. Right. Well, it also gives you a lens into how, how they take feedback and constructive criticism and, you know, what to expect totally so you assume that almost like coaching role early on and i don't sell somebody an interview by being like here's all the money you're gonna make and all the awesome things we're right. gonna do it's like yes we have that who are you and are who you are or is who you are going to fit with who we are and can we develop you and make you a better person over the long term mm -hmm. and if we can and there's room to do that let's talk if there's not 
then maybe this isn't a good fit. And that's totally okay. This takes years to get good at, but the nice thing is if you stick with similar like preferences and abilities in certain roles you're looking for, like you always know salespeople need to have attainment. They need to have a preference set and goals. And you start mm-hmm. interviewing salespeople for that. Two years in, you start to see how things worked out from the people you hired, and you start to get more and more experience around what attainment really looks like in people early on. You get better at sniffing it out. When you're consistent with the things you're looking for, you can obviously start to really see that the you can smell through the BS with people quicker. What do you think about the personality assessments? I like them. I think they give good perspective. I think you need to also give them, a, a take everything with a grain of salt. So like we used to have one that would assist us actually that was custom tailored to these preferences and abilities back in the day, which was really neat. So what they would do is we would score the person and then they would or they would take a personality assessment test on these exact preferences and abilities and then they go operate their franchise and then based on their results they would get fed back into the system and the system would remember what their scores were on all their original stuff and based on how they did and what their scores were it would constantly fine tune what attainment really looked like through like q and a with people which was cool and it was very interesting i would only look at it and say does the computer agree with everything I'm going and, and scoring or does it disagree? And if it agrees, right. it's kind of a checkbox. If it disagrees, all it means to me is I need to investigate this area further. So just it was just a cue for me to look more into something versus just take the computer's mm-hmm. word for it. There's other ones out there, Disk Profile, Myers, Myers-Briggs. I like Disk a little bit just for understanding people. Um, mm-hmm. You know, different personalities react differently to things and Disk is a really quick way to kind of start to just assess people out a little bit and know a bit about them. So a couple of things we talked about, but like big thing is just asking lots of questions. It, probing questions are huge versus if you're trying to interview somebody and say, are you a hard worker? And they're like, yes. You're like, oh, okay, well, great. Check. You know, do you, you know, like what's yeah. your hardest work experience? How long did it last? Like open-ended questions that demand a right. response, right? Remembering that past behavior always equals future results. Stop telling yourself anything different. I know how bad sometimes it is to find good people, but just <laughs> like go with that. Past behavior predicts future results. Um, one thing we didn't talk about as much during interviewing, but I am selling while qualifying. So I'm like right. asking them what's important to them. What did they get from reading our website? You know, I, I'm, I'm silently. And actually, one of the biggest things I ask them, based on everything you see here today, like what are some of the biggest benefits you'd get out of working for, for us? And I let them sell themselves on the, the position by having them describe that to me. I would love to work here because I get this and this and this looks really interesting. And instead of me giving them product puke, that's right. And then, yeah, this is basically like what we just talked about is a fairly structured interview process where there's a lot of thought and, and, and work that goes into it. But what it does is your top candidates are drawn into that. They're looking for an organized organization versus a gong show organization, right? Are you meeting somebody five minutes late for an interview in a coffee shop with no real notes and no real structure? Or are you showing up early, totally prepared, in a professional location where you have set things to go through, you're controlling the conversation, you're giving good feedback at the end? top performers are looking for that they're interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing them that's right yeah to recap on where we went you start with an ideal candidate profile you use that to build your job posting you use those job postings to basically be able to do good conversion calls to find good people to set up interviews for and then you do a behavioral based interview that where you're looking for past performance to predict the future results nice danny thank you for that i'm sure um anyone want, watching is going to want to have access to those um to the, the slides or checklist that you that you shared, so we'll make sure to get those uh, available for 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 download, or we'll at least have the links so you can head over to your website and get those. So that's helpful. Um, beyond that, you know, question for for you, Danny, because you've seen you know companies uh, at least through BTA, you know, join on with you guys at a certain level, and then over time, kind of progress over to different tiers. Hiring in itself, I and mean, at what point should somebody consider? Right, maybe you're you're sub you know a million or two. You're doing a lot of this yourself, or some of the partners are doing you know the bulk of the hiring. At what point uh, have you seen it make sense for companies to justify bringing somebody on to be dedicated to you know uh, to hiring and you know sourcing candidates and going through interviews? And is it just kind of a gut feel thing? It's unlimited in time. I don't have the you know. It's a great question. Yeah, we are starting that. So we started that last year. We had about 25 staff and um, we were definitely feeling the strain of the work required to fully bring people in <laughs> or at least get the, the applicant rolling into the process. So at this caliber, right? Because at this you know, caliber, you 
put job job postings out there and you know they come in cvs come in jump on a call and whatever but if you're from what i've seen just in today in your presentation today this is this is work right and, yeah and like you said one of the first thing you said it's this is sales and marketing yeah. <laughs> right so at this level you said at 25 25 employees that's when you started feeling a little bit of heat in terms of uh getting some people to help us. And so right. the final decision is still made by us, but they help us with sourcing and pre-vetting. And what okay. I will say is if you're bringing somebody in to do that internally, it could be good. It could be a little bit, you know, a bit of an expense at first. Um, we hired a contractor and then we also have um, Igor's um, uh, executive assistant helping. So between the two of them, they're kind of pre-vetting people. And it is, it's a bit of a process teaching people how to look for us or the people that fit us really well. That's probably mm-hmm. most of, we're about a year in now and it's starting to kind of really tick, but it takes a little bit for them to help understand or for us to help them understand who we're really looking for. And then after that, we do start to have more of an interview process that's still Igor and James and I that sit down with the person. Actually, it's largely Igor right now that does most of our, our right. recruiting. And he's even telling me right now, it's... It, it'll, it just hiring a couple people a year is becoming quite a burden on him for everything else he has to go do. So we're looking at different options to how to delegate that out a little bit. But again, it's, I don't know, unless you're over 50 to a hundred people, like it'd be tough to really not be a part of the hiring decision for everyone on the team. Cause every single person is such a pivotal part of the company, right? Until right. you're say a hundred people, like you lose one key person in the, in the middle of your organization, you feel it, right? Or you put in the Absolutely. wrong person, you feel it. So I think for me anyways, like I've always been a big believer, just stay close to that process as much as possible. There is time to delegate it. Absolutely. But don't just let anybody come in without your your eyes on them. If you're over a hundred people, maybe that starts to change a little bit. I mean, even back in the day, I used to hire 150 people a year and I was like, I oversaw the whole process. Good. Yeah. Well, that's a good, good kind of benchmark for people. I'm sure people have that question. Um, and you've got the link up here, Danny. I appreciate that. So try bta.com slash WR recruit, and they'll be able to uh, get the templates that they've seen in today's presentation. So there we have it. Thanks, Danny. appreciate you coming back to share this with us. I know this is a uh, you know, top priority on everyone's list of things that they want to tackle this year. And uh, hopefully the, the no shortage of work continues and will continue to have the need to hire winning, uh, winning caliber candidates and, and you know, talent to join our team. Um, If anyone wants to get in contact uh, with you, Danny, or the folks over at BTA, where do we send them? Aside from the recruit link here. If you're filling this out, actually, there's a little thing that says, I'd like to talk or I'd like to learn about how BTA can help me in my business. Just check that off. Um, You can set up a time to meet with us even, or we can just give you a call. So that's probably the easiest, uh, most direct route. And you'll get a look at our templates, sit, sit down and chat with our team. If you're wanting to just research us and you really just want to look more into the company on our website, our website is B is in Bravo, T is in Tango, academy.com. So that's A-C-A-D-E-M-Y.com. So B-T academy.com. You can read all about us there. There's lots of info and rock and roll from there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Danny. Uh, Great presentation. I absolutely loved it. I mean, this uh, speaks to me. These are things that I've got my hands into. So always uh, good to learn learn a couple things. Uh, For those of you watching, hopefully you enjoyed this content as much as we did. Uh, Leave us your comments below and uh, please, you know, subscribe, like, and share. We'd really appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. See you on the next episode. Cheers. Thanks, Mark. See ya.